Hello and welcome. In recent years, there's been tremendous focus on just what Indian students are losing out, given what is described as the lack of real paucity of research options in the country. There's been much debate on research, which is sadly lacking, and all that we need to do to get Indian students at par with the best in the world. And that's what we're going to look at in depth today as we try and understand how quality research results in world-class students and what really we can do to get India in the top few countries in the world. Remember, on the Global Innovation Index 2015, which covers 141 economies, India's ranking this year is 81 as against 76 just last year. Many, of course, are arguing this is not a true reflection of the status uh, of India. Other students are now saying that they are keen on going out to study abroad simply given the tremendous research options in the country. Well, that's, of course, like I said, our special uh, focus today. Joining me on the panel, Sanjeev Bikchandani is the co-founder of Nokri and Ashoka University. Professor Peter Horton, Pro Vice Chancellor at Deakin University in Australia. Dr. Ram Kumar, General Manager, R&D Indian Oil. And last but not the least, Ravneet Pava, Director, South Asia, Deakin University. Thanks all so much for taking our time to be with us today. Uh, Sanjeev Bhiktandani, as someone who sort of, you know, was, has been tracking and involved in the startup space much before startups became uber cool as they are today, you were among the first movers in this space. Innovation, I would imagine, therefore key to a lot of what you've accomplished. How do you see the space as far as that is concerned in India? No, I think the startup scene, mm. uh, you know, youngsters coming out of college mm. trying to do mm. something, even before they go to college trying to do something, mm. or while in college doing something, I think that has increased manifold. Mm. Now, some of it is innovative, mm. some of it is not really innovative, mm. but you know, if a thousand try, maybe mm. 200 will be innovative, maybe 25 will succeed. Mm. But I think they'll blaze new trails, they will take, uh, you know, industries and, uh, you know, in new direction. Mm. Uh, now, uh, however, having said that, there is actually very little uh, that is coming out of research done in universities right. mm. uh, and that linkage I believe has not been adequately established mm. um, unlike in the US mm. you know you found that mm. Google was created out of a PhD project mm. 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 Uh, Yahoo was created out of a PhD project mm. uh, you know uh, Sun Microsystems mm. came out of Stanford right, right. so or, or the Cambridge cluster in the UK mm. uh, you know that kind of ecosystem has mm. not yet evolved mm. in India mm. uh, there are now uh, clusters of innovators coming out of IIT Delhi or IIT Bombay, but right. that's still not institution linked. Professor Horton, you know, here in I India, uh, like we said at the start of this program, there is a lot of sort of chess beating and hand wringing. You will yeah. have lots of people saying, where is the research? This is where we are lacking. You know, we need our young to go out there. Academia, another ball game. You ask a group of youngsters how many want to get into academia. Very few will actually raise their hands and say, yes, I, I, I want to do it. There are, of course, a whole host of reasons, many of them historical. How do you see the Australia example? as sort of in the lessons that you've learned along the way, which we could perhaps apply here? Well, I think, in fact, in Australia, we're actually also struggling in some ways with mm. these aspects of Australian students going to do research. Mm. And we rely enormously on overseas students coming to do mm. research in our universities mm. for the same reasons. I think that in many ways, what you have to do is have industry showing that there is a career pathway. Mm. I think that you know, your brightest students go to the IITs, they study very hard right, right. and they go into some sort of management or computer job. Right. They're not exposed to research along the way. Mm. Um, they're not exposed to companies saying, you know, if you were to solve this problem, mm. it would really help our, our company and we would give you a sort of position within the company. So it's right. a sort of a two-way street. Right. And we're trying to do that in Australia quite a lot. Mm. We're having a lot more students based in industry. Mm. And so they, you know, they might spend six months of their PhD in industry mm. and get a mm. taste for it. Right. And also the companies, they get a taste that these PhDs aren't just boffins. I think there's right. this image that a PhD student is a boffin, right. whereas in really they're just someone who's got a high level of problem solving right. and can really contribute to a company. Right. And, and that's the point that uh, Mr. Pichandani also made, that the link with industry, of course, be, be being very key. There are, of course, a few sectors where we've seen that, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar, but it, it's not really as widespread or sort of, you know, we don't hear of it enough. Especially uh, in India, now, uh, this need of linkage between academia and mm. industry mm. is actually dawning on the industry. Right. Yeah. Because uh, India and China are the fastest growing economies. Mm. In spite of that, mm. the markets mm. coming from industry, mm. we perceive the markets exist in uh, India and China are mm. the most cost conscious. Mm. So for these cost conscious markets mm. to win the game, mm. 
it is the differentiation right. of the product right. or the process. Right. And uh, industry, industrial R and D and industry are very time bound. Right. Right. So, I think uh, instead of uh, taking a fresh uh, research scholar from a uh, research student from a in uh, from a university. Mm -hmm. If there is a industry academia link up is there, right. if, a, if a person is coming from that link up right. to the industry, right. he would be having uh, the knack of applying his domain knowledge sure. to a given problem. Right. And right. the results will be flowing. The results will be flowing. And that's what, of course, we are hoping for. Before I get Ravneet in, Mr. Bigchandani, you know, we, we, we spoke about startups briefly and that, you know, this is the kind of vacuum that say our young entrepreneurs are trying to fill. Like you said, even before they step out of their college campuses, you know, the, it's the this startup started on campus, that that's sort of making headlines. Now you're also a co-founder of Ashoka University, described as one of, you know, uh, just this filling again a vacuum that we needed, focus on liberal arts. Do you see n the sort of more new age educational institutions trying to step up to the plate and, and sort of filling this No, gap? at Ashoka, we were very conscious from the beginning that it's not just a teaching university, hmm. it's a research-based teaching university. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, if you start off just doing teaching, hmm. it's very hard then to also add research. You've got to right. do both simultaneously. Right. Uh, of course, it's easier, uh, I won't say easier, I would say it's less expensive in social science and liberal arts. You don't need expensive laboratories and right. all of that. So the resources deployed aren't that much. Sure. But as we m move into science areas, and which is Ashoka's next step, we are moving into natural sciences, mm. uh, we will have to make those investments. Right. I think, uh, you know, one is of course conscious strategy. Mm. Two is the kind of people you get in, and therefore mm. the culture you build. Mm. And, and three is, you know, the resources you are able to deploy. Mm. The research payoffs, long term and very often it's you do research and you don't know when it will pay off and once it does pay off you are not able to even you know say that investment made 30 years right. ago has paid off today right. uh, and therefore a lot of research investment is made out of faith right the engineering example of course is a good one we produce more engineers than most countries uh, in the world mm. now of course one can say that they are looking at startups and they're looking at entrepreneurship and, and all of that but so far there was this big question on where are they going and where are where are all our engineers going? But Ravneet, come in, uh, you know, at this point, as, as someone who interacts with students uh, so closely, you're perhaps aware of just, you know, for instance, when we chose the last Deacon Scholarship winner, we, it, 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 was, it was quite a pleasant surprise to see people talk a lot about research. I want to study further. I'm not just out there to get the next high paying job, but I want to focus on research and therefore I'm looking overseas. Yeah, I think uh, we've got lots of interest from students, mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at uh, areas and research that they want to look at. What, what strikes me very clearly is that the, the, it's not conducive here for them to really go on with their passion. Mm -hmm. Because everything is about, you know, th like, like Sanjeev said, it's all about teaching institutions. Right. Even our top institutions right. are focused on being teaching institutions. Teaching so the research culture is not there. Mm -hmm. You know, we run this program at Deakin, which is, um, uh, we have students that are based here in India, mm. enrolled at Deakin in a research project, and mm. they're doing a Deakin PhD, and it's co-supervised between Deakin and Indian supervisors. Mm. And you can instantly see the change in the students' culture mm. and the contribution mm. as they're exposed mm. to real research. That's, of course, an important point. And, and again, I come back to the point of so many students wanting to sort of go out there, go go overseas, you know, uh, they raise the fund, the money, 80% of, in fact, uh, money for ho home loans is uh, sort of generated or is sort of raised by, <coughs> uh, sorry, ha student loans, I beg your pardon, is sort of raised by putting, you know, your home as a collateral. Mm. That is how much we value our education. Yes. Your parents have worked yeah. all their lives to get that one home, but they will put that out as a collateral. But, you know, uh, explain to me how, how you see the space in India, because we are in a, in a space where it's 100% or nothing when you pass out of school, students yes. are told. I mean, we've created only a handful institutions of excellence, unfortunately, <coughs> but students are told if it, you're not maxing your subjects, including language subjects, you're not getting anywhere. And, and it's unfortunate, but it's true. It's also a very interesting tension because mm. in my history of having many PhD students, mm. the best marking students aren't the best researchers necessarily. Mm. You want people with creativity, people who take risks. Right, right. And your right. system is about not taking risks. It's actually right. about you know, conforming. Right. Um, whereas a really top researcher will take risks. And, um, so I, and I find, <coughs> you know, I have students, many students from India doing PhDs with me. Mm. And you know, most of them are very excellent. Mm. Um, some of them struggle though with, with the open-endedness, you know, the fact there is no right answer. I've got to go and do it myself. I've right. got to be hands-on. Right. I've got to get in the lab and do stuff and right. make mistakes. Right. And um, I think that, as you said, the 100% idea makes it very, very hard. And I think that the problem also is you, you sort of second, 
tier universities or third tier universities mm. which are really just teaching there's no mm. even as academics themselves haven't done much research mm. as well along the way mm. and so they're not inf instilling the students with this idea of passion for problem solving for doing startups for doing you right. know different things right and that's an important point that it's not just those who've got the highest scores no, yeah. who not. are going to be the most successful no. and and you are perhaps a case in point you I, 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 I was think. for sure oh really <laughs> oh lovely okay he was okay. a band player oh i see i see so but we don't seem to be able to take our focus away from this because every year it's getting more and more difficult in fact there was this bizarre situation mm. where one college even sort of chose its uh, figures in a strange way where their cutoff was 100 and 100.6 for some uh, subjects. Yeah. So it's 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 just insane. The problem is with the Indian school system. Mm. Actually, many mm. problems. One of the problems is or the board system, is that look, the board exams mm. and the correction mm. has been dumbed down right. to a point right. where it's failing to discriminate at the top. Right. So you don't really know if the 98% student is better than 95% sure, student or 90, sure. 93% student, sure, sure. because at that level. Uh, you know, careless mistakes, mm. neatness, how you are on that day mm. begins to count for a lot. Mm. And if you look only at the class 12 board exam result to give admissions, mm. uh, you are perhaps uh, losing out some very good students right. and taking some not so good students. A whole lot. Right. Mm. Right. right. So I believe the class 12 board exam result is an imperfect measure mm. and therefore should be only used as one indicator mm. to while assessing a student for admissions. Mm. Right. And that's what we do at Ashoka. Right. I think, sorry, can I just Please. say here, Natasha, mm. one of the things that I've found with students is, you know, we've been taking interns mm. from even the top institutions like IITs into mm. Deakin, you know, for various mm. programs in Peter's lab and so forth. One of the things coming back to innovation and coming back to risk taking is that they're just, they're very good, say, technically, right? right. They, they know right. the subject, so right. they can't go wrong with, with right. that. But right. when you put them in a situation which is multicultural, where they have to interact with people, they right. have to be creative, they have to really talk the language, you know, right. the world language, they right. struggle even right. from our top institutions, right. and these are kids in the top 1% we are right. talking about. Right. So, you know, taking Sanjeev's point about when you come down to the second point, I right. mean, all these kids, where are they going to go?